Welcome to Home and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves, featuring conversations with special guests on topics related, but not limited to burnout, mindset, fulfillment, transitions, wellness, and so much more. I am your host, Jessica Locke, Astrala Yoga Guide and Holistic Wellness Coach. And this podcast is not about telling you what to do. I believe we all have the answers we need within. This podcast is here to inspire you, help you find clarity, and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. And of course, we'll be sharing tools and strategies from our guests to embrace your inner wisdom and live unleashed. Ready to dive in? Well, welcome to the podcast. We're going to be starting a series about human design and diving a little bit deeper because I've been sharing about this for a while and teasing it and now we finally have it and I wanted to introduce a very very special friend she's going to be my co-host Courtney hi how are you (laughs) welcome (laughs) hi hi everyone and thank you so much Jess for having me I truly feel lucky to be in conversation with you in general in life but also to have you want to do it publicly (laughs) with me um so yeah just a little bit about who I am um so I have been studying experimenting playing analyzing questioning human design for um about four years now and um I do see I I do currently offer readings both individual and um relationship sessions um but I also see my work as just supporting people and getting closer to themselves getting closer to each other getting closer to life um this idea of closeness really resonates with me and supporting people in their relationship to themselves, but also their relationship to all of these self-discovery tools. Because as you will hear in this episode, um, my relationship with human design and all self-discovery tools has been a real journey for me. And um, maybe sometime other time we'll go deeper into that part of it. But um, I like to support people in, in what this all brings up for them. This can be a very confronting experience to learn about yourself or other people in your life in a new way and so just supporting people in that process yeah and she basically summed up the the purpose and the intention of these episodes to like a playground a place to I'm using your words when you listen to the episode later a place to just explore and understand your energies but also to talk about those little nuances and our relationship to it Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, this is basically our introduction. We're kind of having fun with it. We're going to be talking a little bit about how human design came to be. What are the systems that support, that brings everything together? And a little bit about each center in human design. Yes, we go, we go on a journey when it comes to the origins of human design. So just if you like to geek out about how the world started, this is going to be a great podcast for you. And then if you like to get into the practical stuff later in the episode, it's also going to be a great episode for you. Uh, we, yes. go, we go both. We go all the places. We go everywhere so you don't have to. Or maybe you can come along for the ride with me. I love that. It's our new tagline. We go everywhere so you don't have to. It's probably like a airplane tagline or something. Maybe. Let's trademark it. Yes. It was first right here. That's so funny. All right. Grab a cup of coffee, tea, whatever you want to drink at Cozy and come join us. Welcome, Courtney. How are you? Thank you. you. Thanks for having me. I'm good. I'm excited about this endeavor. (laughs) And um, also excited to hear what comes out of us when we talk about um, an introduction to human design. Yes, because we've been, I guess, navigating a relationship with human design and learning more about it together in our training. And it's been so interesting to try to look at it from all perspectives hold the uncertainty yes and also what feels true to us 
So I'm really excited to share what human design is about, especially because I've been talking about it to my friends and family. And I feel like, oh, how can I share it with you in a way that is <laughs> useful to you? Yeah. But also get to the juicy part of like, how did it start it? What, what are the moving components that make up the system? Yes. It's and, such a thing. <laughs> Right? <laughs> I know that's not a very um, elegant way to put it, but it is. And I think that's been like part of what I've been going through right now is trying to parse out like, what even is this that I have had such, I've been studying, practicing human design almost five years now. Yeah, I think 2022, four years four years um and it has it has been many different things to me over that time and I have been interested in different parts of the system over that time and I think when you're just getting into it you really or at least I really had no idea what all of the layers and aspects were and for, for anyone listening you also don't have to know all that like I just want to give people permission that if they like just hear something and it resonates with them and it makes their life better then that's great yeah, <laughs> but yeah. there is there's there's many pieces that you can get into if you feel called and or have a very active mind that wants to know all of the things right you're right thank you for talking about the nuances and your relationship and how much it's changed because I still feel like a new person like I feel like it's um, it's been like over a year and it and I feel like I'm learning more and because I went into this deep dive with you know ART training right away like wanting to get deep with it so I'm also so curious to hear about your experience and how it's evolved and like I'm thinking of like an accordion like oh sometimes it feels so good and other times like oh, I don't like this anymore yeah <laughs> I love your analogies <laughs> Um, I can't wait to share your sushi. <laughs> My sushi. <laughs> we'll get into that. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody who likes those conveyor belt. <laughs> it was really, it was a really good description. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like I want to respond, but I also kind of want you to answer first to see, because then I can, I feel like I can like play off of what you have shared and not just repeat <laughs> whatever it is. So what, what was your, your first introduction to? design it was through another podcast and it okay. was with um melissa griffin and jazz the mother moon that was oh, her that was okay. her handle i think and i was resistant to the words human design because <laughs> this is like a little bit of a backstory i was trying to like shed my my advertising past my designer i didn't want to keep like, yes, I am a designer, but I didn't want to keep, I wanted to carve my purpose that wasn't being a designer. So human design sound like, oh, is this for like designing for sustainability, designing for humans? I'm like, I'm out of it. I'm not doing this anymore. And then I was like, something led me to just listen to that episode. I'm like, why not? And when I listened to it, I'm like, wait, that is nothing about <laughs> what I thought it was. And I can relate. I think they talked about being a projector and then getting your chart. I'm like, well, what does that mean? So I started looking into it and something clicked, something opened up in me, almost like a voice, like go deeper. Hmm. That was my introduction to human design. Hmm. That is fascinating. I also think it's you? fascinating to think about from what I, I don't know jazz personally, or like just follow them on Instagram. And I, feel like that what she conveys is just such a different take on it that I feel like not even not even that she's like altering the system or anything like that but just her life perspective brings a whole different um flavor yes. so uh, that's interesting to think about too is like the people that we get brought introduced to the system by and how that frames our experience of it um so I also listened to it on a podcast <laughs> mine was though um Jenna Zoe I can't actually remember which podcast it was um there was like a couple at that time that she was on that um became really popular and so 
yeah I mean that's a whole different way of looking at human design too the way that she has framed it and um yeah just like what she's done with it to me sometimes it feels like a whole different world than the like ART version of human design that we're learning right now and it's not um I think maybe this would be helpful for people because it wasn't really clear to me in the beginning it's like human design despite this very (laughs) um bold name of talking about how we are designed as human beings is just like another theory or or way of describing the human experience so it feels I feel like it feels really big and like really um I don't know if finite is the right word or like yeah it's overwhelming <laughs> yeah yeah it feels yeah it's I almost know, like god like an equation <laughs> yes it's almost like seeing yourself in an equation that mm-hmm. you don't understand the moving parts mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. but then there are there are also moments that are so grounding and in such resonance with I guess our inner truth who we are or why we are the way we are that has kept me coming back yes because I know astrology or even Myers-Briggs or the Enneagram system has very similar ways to support people I think the Enneagram is more about people's motivations and human design is more about energy focus so it's almost like little pockets of understanding the human experience but in a language that might resonate with people differently. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's a perfect way to describe it. It's like, in in the way that I, I I think looking at it as a language and as a framework is just first and foremost, a helpful thing to, to get your head around to like, Oh, this is a, this is a framework. This is a language. This is another way to describe the human experience. I've been, um, playing with this idea that lately that human design is kind of like a a landscape painting or like a portrait painting but it's one of those where you're like wait is that real because it it looks so right (laughs) accurate right and sometimes I have to remind myself like wait this is still a painting like this is still trying to describe Mm -hmm. the human experience it isn't the human experience um so that's been a helpful way for me to (laughs) <laughs> this is like expanding my brain like mind blown <laughs> <laughs> well good um or whatever um so yeah just like having it for me at least uh, a more enjoyable more satisfying way to relate to human design is as this descriptor tool but then within that it's like there's the story of human design like where did it come from there's there's Ra Ruhu's story who created human design but then there's also like all these stories of how the universe came to be that influence human design and then there's like the structure which if you are first introduced to human design you probably look at your body graph that's probably the first thing that you see and that's like the structure of like I, t- I kind of think of it as like the playground <laughs> where like everything is coming to coming into form and you're starting to be able to like name things and that's influenced by several different systems which we could talk about and then there's all the like conclusions or suggestions or hypothesis of what to do with all of that information right like how to interpret it and where to go which to me that's where like strategy authority profile etc all those things come into play it's like this is this was one way of interpreting all this information together and then saying here's some suggestions of what you might want to do with all that (laughs) you you might want to live life in this way (laughs) I don't know (laughs) try it out right oh I love the playground analogy because Mm -hmm. human design once we go in deeper into it and learn about, you know, our type, strategy, authority, profile, all of that, it, it can stop becoming a playground. Yeah. We go in through the lens of curiosity. And then afterwards we think, am I doing it wrong? Am I yes. not honoring myself? And we've had so many conversations about this, like with our love and it's not hate, but also like caution of not using this tool that is here to support you 
become a box that you should live a certain way. It's honestly meant to be indicators about how you're doing, <laughs> just to be happier, play with it. And I think it's so important that we keep bringing it back to that. And like a part of me also thinks like, you can live a happy life, fulfill life, whatever it is without human design, if you don't need it. Cause there are people that anchor themselves with different things. Like I, I've heard of people that are like alcohol free coach or cannot speak alcohol free <laughs> coach or like somebody who is, I don't know about movement and that's how they anchor themselves. And in this way we're using anchor, anchor, we're using human design as our, I guess, framework to navigate, but it's not the ultimate thing. Right. Right. And I think from doing such a, a deep dive from reading the first book ever written about human design all the way up to, you know, what we have right now, that it, it definitely gets lost. I feel like in the beginning, um, th and this is of course my own interpretation. I wasn't there. I don't, I don't know, <laughs> but there was like this humility and wonder and awe at this information and at putting all of these systems together. I mean, it truly is genius. <laughs> like when I am just with the synthesis part of human design, I'm like, this is the most beautiful, magical thing I have ever seen or witnessed or experienced or whatever it is. Um, but then like, having an answer for life is really seductive. Who doesn't want an answer? Who doesn't want like a, a strategy? Who doesn't want some sort of something to say like life will be better if you live this way, you know, like that. I, and so I guess what to say is like, it's not surprising to me that it kind of evolved in that direction as time went on. And, and to be clear, Ra Uruhu never says you're gonna have no suffering in life if you do these things right yeah. but even with all of that um awareness that he has when he's describing these things it's still pretty probable that our minds are gonna be like but <laughs> maybe yeah. Yeah. if I follow my strategy and authority I will whatever it is you know have a perfect life or not feel pain or make a bunch of money wh whatever it is and I think that's like one of the most beautiful conversations to have either when you're getting in it in, into it or learning about the system or reflecting back it's like well what did you think you were going to get if you follow your strategy authority I still ask myself that like do I think if I only listen to my sacral authority that my life I don't know I'm going to have the business that I want or the relationships that I want like I still have to catch myself sometimes yeah yeah yeah. and I mean that that is like the same thing when people talk about alignment I know it's like a very buzzword and I I've used it but I feel like I understand what it means because of my own journey of like really dropping the things that weren't serving me and aligning to my values, to how I want to live my life. Now, does that mean, you know, everything is coming easy to me? I don't have hard days. No, like I am still aligned. I am in my version of success. I'm not making those figures that every coach says online that they're making. But for me, that's not what's important. For me, what helps me be like my definition of, of alignment is different than yours. Like everyone's definition is so unique. And if we bring that kind of analogy into human design, it's the same thing, right? Like you live in your design. What does it mean for you? How can it be useful for you? How can you lean onto that when you're going through a challenge by going back to your human design? Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, we, we can go any other way, but I'm excited right now to go a little bit about the origins. I feel like we're teasing about this and whoever's listening is like, can you just tell me what it is? <laughs> yeah. 
I know, we're going to have a four-hour introduction to the introduction. <laughs> I know. I mean, me and Courtney, we can talk for hours because we just, like, build on each other and we're like, oh, let's go on a tangent. Let's go over there. <laughs> yeah. if, if you'd like to, you can describe that because we both have open heads and open minds in human design. So we'll exactly. go anywhere. <laughs> we'll go anywhere. We don't need to be certain. <laughs> nope. Um, so, yeah, what what is there something specific about the origins or like where where do you want to go in that just describe them or what i just just describe your origins the way i feel like you are probably better at describing it than i am but when i heard said ra i i don't even know his full i can't say his full name it's like ra uru, uru, <laughs> like, I'm like, i just yeah. know it's ra <laughs> yeah. I, I know his name was alan <laughs> from yeah. canada yeah i think it was was it robert alan something I think something like that okay. but it's this gentleman who went to Ibiza I think after going through a couple of like life events I think he was just trying to go on vacation find himself or like reconnecting himself again my interpretation <laughs> I have not read through all of it and then all of a sudden he was walking back to his cabin and he sees this bright light like nobody should be there and he channeled this synthesized information which is known as human design this is like a very long story short the part that i like to go at it's that it's the synthesis it's the synthesis of like these established old wisdom from like thousands of years ago it's like parts of elements of the I Ching, Kabbalah, Western astrology, Hindu Brahman chakra system, quantum physics, like people are adding all these different things. And the way I saw it is like, you see the world as like this big different cultures that are trying to make sense of the world. Mm -hmm. And somehow while they were developing their own language and system, mm -hmm. they all work together. Like they saw the world and understood it. Like everyone. And this is what human design is, the synthesis of all these systems that fit in with each other. And I don't know, that just keeps blowing my mind. Even though I'm skeptical about these kind of things usually, I wasn't really into astrology, I read it for fun. But then I'm like, like these people who weren't even aware of each other's existence mm -hmm. were able to interpret things with, I don't know, law of nature, physics, math, whatever they use. To create something and it fits with other parts of another story that's all i have yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i'm like whoa where to go um, so much first i've never heard about the bright light part i never i that's interesting i've never heard of that part um i don't know if it's true i read about it <laughs> me, me that, no <laughs> i don't know either I, that, that's i think that's part of what is um just interesting when you do get interested in it is that relatively speaking there's not a ton of information about Ra Aruhu and or this experience that he had um again I, I was sharing with you that I think the most in-depth description that I've heard of the experience was through the living your design manual um that Richard Rudd edited and revised um but to me, okay, so there's so many things <laughs> that we can, so many directions. Um, <laughs> there, part of this experience that he had was kind of reconceiving how the universe came to be. And so I think most people are familiar with the idea of the Big Bang and like these energies coming together that created the universe. And one of the things that was I'll say revised for him during that experience was that this was actually a conception. So like traditional yang energy, traditional yin energy, which again is a Chinese concept, um, like impacted each other, came together and the earth was actually conceived at that time. Whereas I think our traditional way of looking at it is, was a birth, right? Like this was the birth of something. And who you know I don't know if it's worth it to parse out if it was conception or birth or not but that was one of yeah. the big kind of revelations that came with this experience of the voice as he called it um and then 
within that when that impact happened shatters of that yin and yang energy manifested to create whatever this world is that we now know and um he calls them and he says this is like necessarily symbolic language because it's not we're just trying to describe what it was but describes them as crystals right like shards Mm -hmm. of crystals everywhere and I love in the black book um, which is the first book on human design he talks about how like if you shine a light through like if you think about the crystals as diamonds and you shine a light through them all of the light patterns are going to be different depending on Mm-hmm. you know the shape of the diamond and thinking about that as us right like shining a light through us all of us are going to have different expressions of what that looks like and so um I don't know how deep you want to go but basically he talks about like each of us have a yin and a yang crystal within us and then also this thing that's called the magnetic monopole again this is all symbolic language but just to describe that we basically have our mind, our personality, which is the yang crystal, our body, our design, which is the yin crystal, and then this magnet, if you will, that is actually directing life. And to me, the whole concept of like no choice actually comes from that idea that there is something else. um, Pulling you. Yes, yes pulling this along some sort of trajectory. And I think that can be a super helpful um, way of looking at the world. And I think it can also be harmful. You and I have talked about this before. It's like, when you get into this territory of destiny or only being attracted to things, and then you start talking about trauma and you know um, harmful experiences that we've all had, it's a hard thing to, and, and maybe even a completely unhelpful thing to <laughs> try to, um, conceptualize it into language it's like if you feel that if you resonate with it then I think it's great and if you don't I don't think it's a box that anyone needs to try to fit themselves into or belief that anyone needs to try to adapt if it doesn't just resonate yeah totally and like this is just you know a little bit of how it came to be and when I listened to it I was a bit skeptical like what did that even mean (laughs) but that's why I I like to hear about it, but I also like to focus about the useful parts of, okay, all this, like, okay, Big Bang happened. What do we do now? Like, as human beings, how do we live? And this is so important, but I know there are also elements of that. I think, like, they talk about neutrinos and how that influences us. And that is the entire idea of human design is that we are made up of these energies the yin crystal, yang crystal, and then these energies come together, like biology, cells make up who we are, and, you know, we react to the world around us, and basically, we are in a vehicle that is taking us around the world, living life, but we're also, we're aware of the fact that we are living a human experience, we're not (laughs) <laughs> like I was telling Courtney the other, like we're not dead in a passenger seat because this this could be some of the language that people use. But like, let's talk about neutrinos. Do you like? Are you able to describe it? I feel like you're so good at it. I'm like, tell me about neutrinos because this is where it goes to like the quantum physics part, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll see how this goes. <laughs> Might have to edit this part out. <laughs> but um, okay, so let me first say that to me the implication of neutrinos what what it means to me I I like to always say like okay this is the story that's being told but like what does it actually mean to me so like when I hear about the story about the crystals I'm like what that means to me is that we are of the earth and we are all unique expressions of the whole that's what I hear when I hear something like (laughs) the crystals um whether the story or that description is is perfectly accurate I have no idea and I'd like to not spend my life trying to figure it out. <laughs> right. So then when it, when it comes to neutrinos, the, the implication or like what I get from it is that we are changed and influenced by our environment. Like this isn't some separate thing that we are experiencing where we aren't, um, yeah, imp- impacted or influenced by what's going on around us. And so the part that 
human design does, one of the parts that human design takes from astrology is this idea that the planets in particular have a strong influence on us. And so when it comes to the neutrinos, neutrinos are just sub, sub particle, subatomic particles. <laughs> is that what I'm trying to say? Is that the right word? Subatomic. Um, I think so. Which again, to me, I'm like, okay, energy. <laughs> That's how I'm going to describe <laughs> yes. it. It's just energy, right? And there's all of this, these particles that have a very small amount of mass that are just constantly going in the universe. And what they're doing is they're picking up information and they're also leaving information. So it's like, if you think about them going through the planets, they're picking up the information or the energy of the sun, for example, and then imprinting it on us or leaving the data on us. And so then we're all just like filtering and translating this data from these different places. But you could think of it like, they're going through trees and then that's coming to us. You know, like there's yeah. lots of different <laughs> ways that these particles could um, influence us, I guess, would be the yeah. way to say it. Yeah. But as just you were, that, oh, as you were talking, like the visual that came to me is like, like a plant. Like we understand that the plant needs photosynthesis. That's probably the only thing I learned from science. <laughs> like you need that to grow, but you also need the water. You need like the soil. You need all of it. And those are the elements. Those are like the planets that are filtering through us and helping us and also influencing how we grow. And, you know, and everyone is influencing each other because I think there was this experiment, maybe a tangent, about like two plants that were in a university. One of them were being like yelled, like insulted every day, like just, you know, just not good energy. It's like yelling at it, like, uh. and then the other was being played classical music. It was being um, it was giving compliments every day that plant was like blossoming while hmm. the other was just rotting but they were in the same position to like the sun water all of it but those energies like the words that were being spoken to them affected them so sometimes that's what I how I interpret yeah. the energy and like neutrinos like we're being influenced and sometimes it can those energies and how we use those energies can you know, I want to say rot us, but <laughs> not make us as healthy and vibrant. Mm. And yeah, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> and something else. <laughs> and then something else. <laughs> I, yeah, I like your idea of, or not idea, but that, that concept of just the plants and how they're impacted. And I even think, um, sometimes I think energy just because or at least I certainly didn't grow up talking about energy in this way. And so I think it's also helpful to think about some, some like as simple as you go to a sporting event and you can feel that the energy is so different, right? Than when you're just like at home watching the game or whatever it is, like going to the grocery store, like that's energy, like that, that um, experience that we're having. Or like when you're partner or roommate or friend or whatever comes home and they've had a bad day and you're like oh like I can feel that energy like that that is really what um I don't know to me that's like just puts it into more like simple everyday yes. experiences relatable <laughs> yeah yeah and and human design if we get now to like more of the tool and like useful part of it there's like that story part but then there's also the tools to me it's just trying to describe or not just it's it's profound but it's trying to describe mm -hmm. that energetic experience that we are having both within us individually but then also with other people and then also with the environment around us which includes yes. planets <laughs> yes and that's kind of what leads to type I know we talked mm -hmm. about you know whoa like why is there a type of strategy and authority but like that's what makes the energies that you have activated consistently it's being some into different types and we know it as manifestors who are here to initiate they're here to start things sorry i'm going um, to um charge my computer so continue <laughs> <laughs> i am listening i'm just it's making a lot of noise <laughs> I'm not hearing you yeah oh okay. and then there there's also the manifesting generators actually i think i should go let's start over there so this is how they make up the type based on the energies that you 
um, activate it and consistently within you. And the first being manifester who is here to start to initiate. There's also generator. They're known as the life force of the planet. No pressure. <laughs> That's what I tell everyone. Like, whoa, who does that even mean? But that just means you have a lot of like sacral energy. Your energy is, it can power a lot of things. That's just simply how you are. There's nothing you need to do about it. <laughs> there are <laughs> manifesting generators that are kind of like a, they have the abilities of both because they have similar energetic centers that are activated. So they are they can initiate things. They can also appear to sustain things to keep them going. And there are projectors that are here to guide energy to see what's going on, what can be improved. And there are reflectors who are here to reflect how is the energy around them? How are things around them? That's kind of like the breakdown, the super simple breakdown of the types. Anything to add? <laughs> Um, I mean, I think we could add a lot of things, but I wonder if maybe we talk about the centers and what centers are. That might be more helpful. Right, because, what do you think? yes, yes, because depending on what centers you have activated, that's what make up your type. Yeah. Activated slash consistently on. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll just do like a really quick, so like, story of the universe then we're going to take these different systems as you were talking about like uh, so the main ones are astrology the I Ching um, which is the Chinese book of changes um, the ch chakra system which one am I forgetting oh and the um, tree of life the, yes so so what happened again <laughs> anecdotally we weren't there but was the this experience of raw understanding how all of these systems could fit together to describe the human experience and so when they came together the chakra system which i think maybe a lot of people are familiar with have like these energy hubs and um for example uh, one of the biggest differences in human design it, goes from seven centers, which is what we're used to in the chakra system to nine centers. And just like each hub is trying to describe a different type of energy. So maybe uh, Jess, you were talking a little bit about like the sacral center is trying to describe this like life force, creative, sexual energy. And some people, depending on when you were born and where you were born, your birth information, have that center activated or turned on or defined there's all sorts of different ways yeah. that we describe that um which as you were saying like means or or can be can be interpreted as we have that energy consistent mm -hmm. and i don't know do you want to go into more centers or do you want to just yeah. talk about the sacral center and how that actually i wanted to say why it's important that you're to have an accurate place of birth and time of birth because that's we talked a little bit about neutrinos which is you know the concentration of energy that was present at that moment the moment you're born you're being like flush with it the environment is surrounded by it so that's what makes up the energies that you have that's why it's important to have like a accurate birth time or approximate I think accurate is better but you know life happens it's never accurate like my parents don't know the birth time um so an approximate just to get a better sense of okay, what was happening in that environment? What was happening at that moment? So you can also understand why you have those energies. Yes, yeah, I think that's really helpful. And if you do end up getting a reading from Jess or I or, I or I or someone else, they can help you see what the differences would be. Like if you're like, I think I was born within this 10 minute window, or I think I was born within this four hour window, like we can see what changes would be sometimes your chart would be a whole different chart and other times it doesn't change at all throughout the day because it's yeah. again based on like where the planets are moving if it's going to um impact your profile or your type or yeah yeah definitely yeah. definitely yeah. 
That was good. You're so good at like summing all these like complicated concepts because I hear about these stories. I'm like, cool story. And I'm like, how do I tell this again? So thank you, Courtney, for that. (laughs) This is relatively new for me. I mean, (laughs) as I said, like my journey has been an interesting one and it's it's only been within the last like year or so that I've been like, well, what is actually going on here? Like I was very (laughs) focused on other parts of the system for a really long time. Um, I actually, well, do you want to go down this route or should we continue talking about centers? Yeah. Maybe we should go to the centers. We can, okay. we can bring it back. Yeah. <laughs> this is two open heads here for anyone who is also already familiar with human design. You will understand later. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So well, do you want to go through the centers or do you want to just talk about how the centers make type? Which one? Let's go through the centers and then how the combination could make type. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to start or you want me to start? Do you want to start? Would you like sure. to? <laughs> <laughs> sure. um, okay, so we'll just start from the top. So if you do have um, your human design already, um, it might be helpful for you to pull up your body graph and then you could visually see. I think it's much more helpful when we have visuals. Yes. Um, so the top center is called the head center or the crown center. Um, and that is trying to describe this like inspirational knowing energy like how do I know (laughs) in life like this pressure that I feel to know this pressure that I feel to um answer questions perhaps that is what that center is describing is like inspiration um the pressure to know if we want to translate this into kind of like how this might express itself sometimes we can look at things like philosophy and like um the big questions about life um but it could also be like inspiration going to an art museum (laughs) like it doesn't have to be those big (laughs) questions but it could be do you want to yeah add anything refine refine that i'm like if anybody's watching this as a video maybe i can share like a a visual Mm. of that chart you can let me know when you see it yeah yeah i can see it yeah. So what Courtney was talking about was like the head and crown, which is the pressure centers where you get inspiration. I think that's the easiest way to do it because we can go into details. But sometimes when you're first learning about something, it's just learning the basics is a good way to start. Otherwise, my brain, like ever since I started learning about this, my brain has been hurting in a good way. And I've had to like <laughs> take breaks and like not think about it. Yes, <laughs> I can agree with that. <laughs> And then the next one, the one that kind of interprets all your downloads, all your inspiration is the mind, Ajna Center. It's a processing from ideas to concept, details and answers. Doesn't mean you'll always get the details and you'll always get the answers. But when the energy is there, when the transits, when the people, then, you know, certain, you might find yourself with answers. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So maybe we should reiterate that these centers depending on your birth information can be undefined which would be white in your chart or defined which would be colored in so Mm -hmm. like on this example that we're looking at it it's like everything is defined or yeah everything's color in just for reference but yeah yes that's that will make up your type depending on what's colored in and what's not and then the throat center, <laughs> which is traditionally seen as the expression center, communication. Um, yeah, like manifesting and expressing something coming to life out of us, whether mm-hmm. that's words or action. Yeah, and something that I found really interesting is that all the energies in our chart are trying to reach to the throat because mm-hmm. I didn't even realize how important the throat center was. and. It, mm-hmm. The show center doesn't just mean talking. It could also, like you mentioned, like writing. It could be any type of expression or creation. I think that's how I see it. It's like the area where you get to create whatever ideas you have, whatever inspiration you got. Like this is where it comes out, part of it, of that energy. Yes. Um, (laughs) I'm like, do I want to do the G center? Do you want a G center? (laughs) (laughs) Courtney so, has a defined G-Center. <laughs> yes. um, which, again, to like 
like maybe be more concrete that would in in human design that would mean that i have a more consistent sense of in this case self um which the g center is referring to um like more traditionally how we think of identity is what we could capture in the g center energy um our direction in life um so for folks that would have this defined it would be like more of a um, consistent direction in life and I just want to make a plug that if you have a defined G center and you have no idea what you're doing in life or you don't feel connected to your purpose at all you are not alone and that is okay and that it doesn't mean anything about like a intellectual understanding <laughs> of yeah. who you are um it's more of like, again, an, an energy that you would feel less of like, I can write a five-year plan on what my purpose and, and um, right. why I do in life. It, perhaps it isn't about knowing the how of what you want to do. It's more like just an inner knowing that I want to do that. Yeah, I mean, I think that would maybe get more into like type and authority as far as how someone would get in touch with it. Mm-hmm. But I just think, I know my first thing when I learned about having a defined G center was like, it, people would say like, this is your a consistent um, access to your purpose or like a consistent path in life or something. And I was like, what? I have no idea what I'm doing with my life. Like it just felt, it, it, I, I took it, I interpreted it as something that was like, I must be doing something wrong because I don't have this understanding of who I am. and. Now, in hindsight, I can see it wasn't really about me intellectually getting it because other people, when I would ask, they were like, oh, yeah, <laughs> you, you consistently show up in a, in a similar identity, no matter what you're doing and where you're going. And like other people can see that consistent yeah. expression of who I am. Um, but that wasn't something that I intellectually had connection to. Right. Because how we see ourselves is so different than how people see you. And there was something that I heard somewhere that like every person that knows you have a different version of you in their head. Mm. Mm. I kind of love that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's just like some of the nuance and caveat. And thank you for adding that because sometimes when we look at a chart, I think like, so the next chapter is ego heart. And this is a center for willpower. It's ego drive and determination worthiness. And I have that center defined. And I was like, what? I don't have consistent sense of worthiness. I don't have consistent, but I do have consistent will. I know that if I really want to do something and it's aligned to me, I will push my body (laughs) to do it, which Mm. is not good. But, you Mm. know, I understood the will part, but then the worthiness. And that just comes back to just because you have the consistent energy doesn't mean you are being leading in a high expression because every single center can be conditioned. Conditioning is influence. And there's good influence, there's bad influence, and it's just part of life to understand what is more me and what is not that. That That's not my voice. I've been conditioned to believe that I'm unworthy. I've been conditioned to believe that my worth comes from work, comes from proving myself. And it's funny because this energy, when you have it defined, sometimes they say it's good for you to prove yourself, to set like Mm. certain goals and deadlines. And I've been really experimenting and understanding what that Mm. means. I've always wanted to prove myself in life. It wasn't until I changed, like shift from proving to people to myself. Mm. Because I I like setting goals for myself. I like being able to hit it. It feels very good for me as long as it's for me and it's aligned to me. Not when I'm like, oh, I'm going to make X figures because I want my parents to know that (laughs) I got it together. (laughs) That proving, you know, it doesn't work for anyone. And for someone with an undefined ego, that's why they they often say you're not here to prove yourself because you don't have that consistent energy, but you can still do the things you like, but you're just driven and motivated in other areas that you do have perhaps consistent energy. And if you don't, as a reflector, you're here to just merge all the time but I'm getting ahead of myself (laughs) (laughs) yes I I love what you were just saying and I feel like you're demonstrating that I something that I think is like the true power of this part of the human design system is just coming into relationship with yourself around that particular energy 
like around value, around worth, around proving like what have I been fed or told or learned from example that that all of those things mean. And whether you have it defined or undefined, that that's what we're doing with each of these and like just coming into a relationship with that energy and seeing how um what helpful and unhelpful messages and ways of being we've learned and mm-hmm. been taught and or and or even have like um adopted and perpetuated ourselves you know like obviously I would imagine most of us who will be doing something like this are adults and so at this <laughs> point there's a responsibility that I have to take we well we don't have to but we can take around our experience and so for me it's like just getting it into relationship with that energy so I have a wide open ego and heart center um, which means that none of the gates around it are defined and and um I think even though you talk about you know from this defined lens it's it's a similar journey in some ways it's just how do I want to be with it that's maybe different Like I still was having to do the same questioning as you, like, do I want to prove myself and what do I want to prove myself for? And what does proving energy feel like to me? Does it feel good or bad? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Oh, see, I love these conversations because it adds to nuance. So, so many times people are turned over like, what, this is what it is. And then they walk away from this tool that could be helpful. But I, I think talking about these nuances can help us, like you said, be in relationship with yourself, understand your energy and explore because your relationship with that energy could change over time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it does. Thank gosh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thankfully. Yeah. <laughs> I feel very grateful for change when I think about things like this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay. We can go to the solar plexus because we both yeah. have it undefined, but the yeah. defined area is emotions and feelings, sensitivity, and it's, what I interpret from this is that you always have an emotional charge, like an emotional energy. Hmm. Those who don't have it defined does not mean you don't have any emotions. Like, I think that is like the biggest myth or like misinterpretation. You have it, but it just doesn't influence the people around you, like an energetic charge. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think the solar plexus is, I don't really have, I don't, I don't know that there needs to be a hierarchy, but it's just one of my favorite centers and one of the most profound I think experiences that I've had like getting in touch with this emotional energy and I feel like um there's so much conditioning um whether um notwithstanding what gender you identify with but of course there's like very gendered conditioning also around yeah. emotions, like who can have emotions and how can they show up and what can they look like? And um, what I also love about this center is it's, well, I don't want to get into deeper things, but I know. <laughs> I'll just, I'll try to be brief, but I feel like what I also love about this center is coming into relationship with my idea of truth and coming into relationship with conflict and coming into relationship with, being confronted with truth and the conflict that that can stir up (laughs) like I just the center yeah there's a lot of a lot of stuff here that um can be explored and um one of the ways that undefined versus defined centers are talked about is like if you do have the center undefined or open that's that in traditional or not in traditional human design but traditionally in human design we could talk about that as one of the places that you're like going to school in life like that's where you're Mm -hmm. learning about that energy because you are taking in energy from someone else or other people or the planets and the transits it's a receptive part of you where you're just like experiencing this energy and so there's a lot of wisdom that can come from that um yes yes one thing i forgot to lead with was that you know any center that is undefined open that's where you amplify. That's where you take in that energy. And, you know, we're going to go into each center in like different episodes because we can go so deep into each one of them. But like learning to hold or to understand which energies you're holding on to and what is not, it's powerful just as understanding which centers you have to find. What are you influencing? What are you always bringing to the table without you even knowing? Because we are not aware of these energies all the time, but 
sometimes just being more mindful of it, of like, oh, I have an emotional charge. I need space right now. And knowing that not everybody might understand can help you, I guess, can help us coexist and understand each other better because our energies are different, like more compassion for why, oh, like someone as a sacral being, which is the next center that we can talk about. It's like, why can they sleep with me? As an example, not all of them, like five hours a day and me as a projector, why do I need 10 hours? Like, is something <laughs> wrong with me? That was something that I was like, what is wrong with me? And then I'm like, oh, I just don't have this energy. I just need rest. There's nothing wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes <laughs> I'm like oh let's have a whole discussion around sleep okay <laughs> yes so um yeah I this um I feel like actually maybe you're probably better at talking about the sacral center because I have it defined <laughs> I feel like sometimes these spaces that we have defined I don't have as much intellectual knowledge to give around it because I'm like it just is just <laughs> like, it's just, right. yeah, it's just this creative life force um, energy. And I, I actually love to think about the distinction between the sacral and the solar plexus, because I think that sometimes this gets muddied and, and it's okay. Like it, it can be, they don't have to be hard lines, but the difference between sexual, like life creating energy versus like romantic energy, mm. which actually lives more in the solar plexus in my experience and opinion. Um, I think sometimes those things get confused and yeah, they can just be different things. Right. <laughs> mm, such a good detail. I, I've actually never thought about it because I just hear like, oh, sexual energy. So the way I see it and I felt it, like my husband is a generator, so he has this energy. Like it's, there are people that they can, when they're happy, they can power up the room. Like you can feel that energy and the same thing as, but I mean, it can also be, it's so close to emotions, like you said, because certain people that are sad, you can also amplify those emotions, but the life force energy is kind of like, it's an energy that is, that can be self-sustained by doing what you want. It gets activated when you say yes to things that are exciting to you. And then the more you do it, the more it kind of sustains. Sometimes you get lost doing what you love it could be woodworking it could be hiking it could be just designing something and other times you know a task that would take 10 minutes um feels entirely draining because you do not want to do it it's not exciting and that speaks a little bit about this energy how it just it has so much power for the things you like and it has the ability to influence and kind of it's like I'm trying to like think of good words that wouldn't sound like you are battery. You're not a battery. You're not a human battery. <laughs> we're just machines. But, yeah, we're all just machines that are like connected to each other. But you have this, you just have this life force that gets activated when you do what you love. You are not responsible for how others are amplifying it. Like we are all responsible for ourselves. So that's kind of the caveat I want to talk about. But yeah, this, that's all. I, I guess I feel like I'm so unfamiliar with this because I've amplified mm. it so much. And I've overworked myself thinking that I was excited about something mm. or thinking that I had the energy to do it. And tying this with a little bit of the will, there's a deadline. I can prove myself. I can do it. And then burning myself out because I didn't have the consistent sacral energy to mm-hmm. actually sustain me. Mm-hmm. I wonder, I don't know if we explicitly said this, but I think it might be helpful too to contextualize the sacral, the solar plexus, the ego and the root all as motor centers and yes so they're um again not not to <laughs> turn us into machines because we are not despite capitalism <laughs> um <laughs> like they are there is energy to to go to move to make something happen um and this is a little bit of like just an anecdote but to me a lot of my learning has been around so i have a defined sacral in human design and one of my learnings has been around parsing out those different types of energy because sometimes people describe sacral energy as excitement and that's not wrong necessarily but I often feel like excitement actually lives more in solar plexus Mm. territory and there's been many times in my life where I have just been excited, right? Because I'm like emotionally excited around yeah. someone talking about something or an idea or something like that. And I'm like, yes, that. 
and then I leave the room or the conversation or whatever it is it's like wait no I don't actually there's like no sustainable energy there Mm -hmm. and I think that's like the a, a key difference between sacral energy and then some of these other centers is the sustainability of it that it can be recharged regularly like you still need rest <laughs> just to yes put you can burn there. out again yeah adding all yes. the caveats like you can burn out there is I think there's more people who's realizing just because they had the energy for it doesn't mean they should and doesn't mean it was necessarily a line and something that you reminded as you were talking about like excitement and solar plexus sacral is also about pleasure life pleasure because to it, I think about it of enjoying life I know it can come from many other areas but this is the energy where like life is good I'm building something I'm I want to create it's like a creative driving force yeah I think I I like that and I think I guess this is true for all of the centers but when it comes to the sacral center it's so flavored by all the centers around it to me like by which gates and this is again we're, this is a little bit more in depth but like by which gates are activated it is like a different kind of energy which is true for all of them but I feel like maybe just because the sacral is like right in the middle there it is yeah. to me so <laughs> impacted by the different energy by everything yeah and like what a good reminder that these energies don't show up like individually it's everything's holistic mm-hmm. it's not one thing before the other like when you are reacting to one of these energies, you are, everything is intertwined. We just don't see it. And we're talking about it separately, but yes. it happens holistically. Yes. Yes. Good caveat. Yeah. I feel like you should talk about the root center because I feel like you have lots of life experience around the root center. Oh, you know, yeah. Burnout, the story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> so the root center in human design is seen as the energy hub for life fuel, momentum, adrenaline, stress, pressure. And they talk about stress as we all need stress to survive. Like I think stress has been debunked in the past couple of years as something negative. Like we do need stress. We need adrenaline. But there's also limited quantities. Like that matters because just like salt, you need salt in your life. You can't just eat Mm. blonde food. But you eat too much of that, that ain't good. (laughs) So that's the same for root. And I have it open, which means I amplify anybody who has this consistent pressure. And for me, it doesn't feel consistent. So I might get a task from someone or not a demand, but someone will tell me like, I want to plan this party. And all of a sudden my root will be like, okay, this is what I'm going to do because I'm amplifying this momentum, this thing to do. But because it just comes at the spurt of the moment, I don't know if spurt is the right word. I'm like, whoa, let's do everything with it. It's almost like a high if I don't catch myself. And I'm like, oh, and then like my body, if I don't tune into my body, when the person is gone, when the energy, the, the, the momentum is gone, I drop <laughs> burnout, bitter, <laughs> yeah. tired I'm like what the hell did I do to myself and when I learned about human design and language it was you were just amplifying everybody's pressure and momentum doesn't mean it's a bad thing but if you don't catch yourself and I think there was a saying like um you don't know when enough is enough mm-hmm. and I know we're like we've been going so deep into like the the lower centers because we got so excited but yeah yeah we are going to have an episode for each center. So don't worry about this, but like adding a little story here, like I was helping out at a party and I remember it was super late and I was like, okay, time to clean up, do all the to-do things. And I was like, so carried on to this until like, um, my friend was like, it's okay. We've done what we can today. Just rest. And I checked later. She does have a consistent pressure. So she knows when Mm. things will be done. She's like, don't worry about it. Like things will be done. And then the moment I sat on the couch, I felt my body that was like, <sighs> like you know, almost like a doll that was like being held. I was like, I'm like, oh, I was running on borrowed energy. Oh, now I'm aware of it. But I was like so high on that adrenaline that I didn't notice. I love that. I have so many directions we could go, but I'm just going to say that was perfect. And <laughs> then we can talk about this clean center because I yes. <laughs> we'll end up doing an hour just on the root center. <laughs> I know. Do you want to talk about the spleen since you have that undefined? 
Sure. Yeah, I'll talk about, I'll start. Um, so as this says here, it's around instinct and what we traditionally call intuition. So this is something that I know people who come to human design or learn about human design can get kind of confused or tripped up by is like, oh, so only some people have intuition and other people don't. Mm -hmm. But what this, the, the way that we like um, societally use the word intuition would be actually be more um, appropriate to attach to authority that each of us have. Like we all have our own inner knowing and that looks different for all of us. But this is more around like, uh, um, tr is, would traditional be the right word? Understanding of like instinct and that way mm. of describing intuition. Um, Biological? Is that? Is yeah, that... maybe. Yeah. I I think. Yeah, yeah. We could we could go deeper into that in our episode. Um, <laughs> but what I one way that I recently heard the. Um, spleen center defined or yeah described was as like a human washing machine <laughs> and mm -hmm. it's like this is where we're like um processing and cleansing like what's going on in our lives and so a uh, theme that can be associated with the spleen center is letting go or not letting go and like holding on to things that maybe aren't serving you anymore longer than you need to hold on to them um, or being able to let things go and like this idea that if you have it undefined you don't have this consistent like washing machine this consistent like mm -hmm. cleansing of energies or whatever it may be um, or processing that information which really resonated with me as someone with an undefined spleen I was like oh mm -hmm. yes like there are definitely times where I'm like oh and I should I should say this center is also about safety and fear and so there can be this thing of like well, that person just feels safe to me. And so I'm going to hold on to them forever because they give me this feeling of safety that I don't have on my own all the time. Um, and so, yeah, the whole process of letting that go or, you know, realizing is it healthy for me or not? Lots of, lots of questions that can be stirred up by the spleen center. That's true. But like, thank you for that wisdom and that awareness. And it's so fascinating because I, yeah, I love that you, specified on intuition because we all have intuition it might speak to us in a different way or like everybody connects with our intuition differently and the spleen it's also they talk about it as like how it there's like seven fears that you move through in mm -hmm. the spleen this is what it's there for and again we will go to the details like it's so tempting to just dive in but this is also about fears like what are you afraid of? But also what, what keeps you alive? Like, don't go over there. Like we, I think even when you don't have a consistent, you will know what is safe or not, but it, you might not be able to rely on it all the time versus someone who is always like having a, a splenic voice that's always activated and speaking in a very quiet energy. Yes. I think maybe a good not necessarily that we have to wrap it up, but like a good um, closing thing would be to think about these centers that we do have defined, um, interpreting them through this human design lens is saying they are limited in some way. They're consistent. They are being expressed, but they're also limited in the sense of your experience of that energy. Mm -hmm. Like if we take the spleen center, hypothetically, you just would experience this energy in your limited way right depending on which gates you mm -hmm. have activated whereas like for me i'm going to this resonates for me like i'm going to experience instinct and intuition and fear from all of these different <laughs> lenses and and perspectives and so there's this real like expansive energy when it comes to them being open but it takes longer to learn about them and get in touch with them right because you're experiencing all of these different things whereas when you do have something defined it's to, in my mind it's like easier to kind of relate to because it is or or like at least the way that we're taught to relate to things it's easier because it is more like you can wrap your ha hands around it or your mind around it a little bit better because it is this defined or this limited experience does that resonate with you yeah totally and like we know what we know yeah. <laughs> our life is only what we see so yeah like 
our interpretations of that is from our lens, from us experiencing what it means. And you're invited. You're welcome to come up with your own exp exploration, to explore it, to see how this lands for you. And there was something that was in the tip of my tongue that might come back later. Oh, I was wondering if we should talk about how to define centrist makeup type. Oh, sure. Since I we just covered them. Can I say one more thing? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I, I, I feel like when it comes, we've like, we've like done these full <laughs> big, big circles, but if I think about human design in a really practical sense, one of the gifts that it has given me the most is what you were just talking around about. Like we have limitations. Like we are, and, and I mean that in the best way possible, like that we, we see the world in a certain way. We experience the world in a certain way. And I don't mean certain as in like never thing, just in a unique way, I guess is a better, better way to say it. We experience and see the world in this unique way. And to give myself the permission and everyone the permission to not try mm -hmm. to see it and experiencing it from everyone else's perspective that was one of the most, I feel like still is one of the most profound things that human design has offered me. It's like, there is such liberation in embracing my li limitations and knowing that every person is contributing to the whole, or at least I want to believe this. I don't know if it's true, but this is what I want to believe that each person is contributing to the whole just by being yourself and by embracing your unique way of seeing and being <laughs> I have chills too <laughs> I have chills I oh, this is I mean if I'm gonna add in the nuance the sprinkle of nuance this yeah. you just witnessed the G center the definition the defined G energy coming through and like the more I learn about it the more I learn to recognize these energies at the beginning mm -hmm. when people would tell me something I'm like what <laughs> now it's like oh that is the flavor of like that certainty that sense of direction again it's not being specific of knowing the how or the details in like the mental way but it's just this inner knowing of like uh, what you just shared and I want to like just end this episode but I'm like should we still talk about the type of what makes up or should we oh, carry right. this yeah I was like this is such a good way to wrap it up <laughs> so, um that what do you want to do what feels good to you Let's take this for the next episode so we can talk okay. about type, the strategy, and the authority, maybe, since yeah, we covered good. so much ground today. <laughs> we did. <laughs> it was fun. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much for joining me. And you are welcome to message us. I will include Courtney's details, our notes, any questions that you have. So you can also share and we can you know, create those episodes for you. We want more people to learn about their human design and make it accessible it doesn't have to be complicated just understanding yourself create a relationship with yourself yes and one thing i will plug for future episodes is we're hoping to do some mini chart interpretations. so if you already know your human design or are excited to learn it and you want to message us and um share your chart we would love to include it in a mini like interpretation in a future episode yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the Whole and Unleashed podcast. What was your takeaway from today's conversation? Let me know in the comments or review. I would love to hear from you. Subscribe to get new episodes each week and visit wholeandunleashed.com for more information.